Hi, my name's David Markham and I'm a technical manager with Tarmac. And in this video, I'll explain the basics of carbon footprinting of asphalt. Industry has been talking about the green agenda for years and also it has moved on some way, it appears, along with most other areas of industry and society, to be getting quite serious now. It seems it won't be long until roads are procured, not only on the basis of cost and quality, but also on their sustainability or carbon footprint. The proper way to refer to this whole area is life cycle assessment, sometimes life cycle impact assessment, but this is commonly abbreviated to LCA. This is because the relevant international and European standards use this title. The LCA framework is set down in a document that glories under the title of BSEN ISO 14044, but you'll be relieved that I'm not planning to cram a week's worth of lectures into 15 minutes, so we'll just be covering carbon footprint, which is still probably the most important part of LCA, certainly at the moment. But if you come across any of the following terms, then you've strayed into the LCA arena. If you've looked at an asphalt carbon footprint report, you may have noticed the units. Most of this is common sense. It's how many kilograms of CO2 there are in a tonne of asphalt. And normally that applies at the gate. So you need to be careful at um, what point the asphalt is actually calculated. But in most instances, companies like Tarmac will calculate it at the gate as we produce it. The one thing that's maybe not clear is the, what the E stands for, and that's for equivalent. CO2 isn't the only greenhouse gas. There are others, each with their own potency. So to keep it simple, everything else released as part of production is converted into the equivalent CO2 quantity so that you just get a single number. So what stages are there in CO2 production as part of laying asphalt on a road? Well, you can view it as coming in five stages. Firstly, there's the constituents. That's mostly the aggregate and the bitumen in the mix, but also any processing of any wrap that is added back into the mix. Then there's heating and drying. This is the drier fuel used to heat the aggregate and to boil off any moisture in the aggregate before we add the bitumen to it. Then there's other production energy. So this is the plant electricity and the fuel used in loading shovels, etc., and running the site generally. At this point, we've captured the cradle to gate CO2. The gate meaning the gate where the asphalt leaves the asphalt plant. But there are two stages after that to add on before we get to the final as built CO2, which as a road owner, is probably the one that you're most interested in. The first of these is transport. So that's the fuel used in hauling the asphalt to site, which needs to take into account whether the wagon returns empty or whether we're fortunate and it can take back a load of planings from the site back to the asphalt plant for processing. Lastly, there's installation. That's the fuel from the paver, the rollers and depending on the level of detail you want to go to, even the fuel used in the van getting the gang to site each day. So these five elements added together give you the combined as laid carbon footprint of asphalt. You can work out from first principles how much energy it needs to heat a ton of stone and to boil off a kilogram of water. And it might be interesting to run through these quickly now without getting hung up on units and what they mean, the en what energy does it take to heat aggregate sitting on stock from an ambient temperature of say 15 degrees up to 180 degrees, ready to make some hot mix asphalt and to boil off say 2% of water content in that the aggregate feedstock that's been fed up to the plant. So here you can see the numbers and it's perhaps a surprise that over a quarter of the heating and drying energy is needed just for the 2% of moisture content in the aggregate. Increase that to just 3% moisture and approaching 40% of the energy is needed for turning 
the 3% of water into steam. Whether or not these numbers translate exactly to the fuel use of an asphalt plant dryer, it's still an interesting insight into the energy involved in running an asphalt dryer and why feeding aggregates, particularly dust directly from dry screenhouse bins, as opposed to taking it from stock, which is open to the elements, is the ideal solution. So back to the elements in the process of laying asphalt and their carbon footprint. Taking DBM 50 binder course as an example, and say 25% reclaimed asphalt content with an output temperature of 175 degrees centigrade and a 20 mile haul to site, then these are the typical CO2 figures we get. So well over half the energy derives from heating and drying. This is why the industry, as well as consistently pushing up reclaimed asphalt use, has also focused on reducing production temperatures as we try and improve asphalt's sustainability. It's interesting to note that the carbon footprint after the plant gate comes to less than 10% of the total. So really the carbon footprint sits, sits pretty squarely with the constituents, but mostly with the heating and drying energy. How do we calculate asphalt carbon footprint? The asphalt industry, in collaboration with Highways England and the bitumen industry, funded TRL to produce a carbon footprint tool for asphalt. It's called ASPECT, which stands for the Asphalt Pavement Embodied Carbon Tool. And it's now actually 10 years old, which is a, a sign of how long the industry has been preparing for the process we're now starting of a much greater focus on carbon footprint. Aspect includes software, which if you give it the relevant constituents and plant data will calculate the at the gate carbon footprint for each asphalt produced at a plant. But Aspect isn't alone and Highways England have their own carbon tool, which currently takes a single figure of all for all asphalt types of 55 kilograms a ton. So you, you need to be careful when people quote carbon figures on a scheme of exactly where the carbon figure for asphalt has come from. Is it a bespoke figure that's been calculated by Tarmac or another supplier using Aspect, or is it a default figure from one of the gen more generic asphalt carbon um, tools? So you can reduce the carbon footprint of asphalt by reducing the temperature. And this takes you into the warm and semi-warm asphalt technologies. You can see from this slide that hot mix is roughly 150 degrees centigrade upwards. Warm mix is between 100 and 150. And semi-warm sits below uh, 100 degrees. Thus far, Tarmac has focused on warm asphalt. That means keeping the temperature above 100 degrees C, so still driving off all the moisture in the aggregate feed. Warm asphalt is in the range 30 to 40 degrees cooler than traditional hot mix. For this, we use a chemical additive that makes the bitumen as workable, even though it's at a lower temperature, allowing the surfacing gang to get the same level of compaction and laid properties. A typical carbon reduction with warm asphalt is around 9%. And that's of the total laid carbon footprint. If you look at it just as the carbon at the gate, then it'll be slightly higher. Warm asphalt is covered by SHW 900 series, and there is shortly to be a revision containing more requirements for warm asphalt, including a maximum supply temperature. So look out for that. It's expected sometime around the middle of 2021. Semi-warm technologies that tend to hover around the 100 degree centigrade value maintain workability by actually leaving moisture in the asphalt. And it's the steam of these little pockets of moisture that give it the, uh, the workability to bring it back to a sort of hot mix equivalent. Going back to a previous slide, you can see the carbon attraction in not driving off all the moisture in a mix. But leaving moisture in asphalt is counterintuitive. 
because throughout my career I've spent a lot of time making sure aggregates are dried and to keep water out of pavements when we build them. Regardless of the technology, as an asphalt producer, switching between conventional hot mix and reduced temperature asphalt is wasteful in terms of both cost and carbon. So the sooner the UK adopts warm as the default asphalt, the better for all of us. And we're working as an industry with the clients on documents like PD6691 and BS594987 to make them more accommodating for warm and, and other reduced temperature asphalts. The key message for warm asphalt is that specifiers don't need to change the basics of the mixtures they've always procured as hot mix. Warm DBM50 base will still meet the necessary in situ properties of stiffness and deformation resistance, but just with a carbon saving. Lastly, as an industry, we need to start thinking about the implication of the 2035 requirement for the UK to reduce our car overall carbon emissions by 78%. Clearly, this is going to be challenging and may require higher recycling rates and probably the use of green zero carbon fuels to heat and dry asphalt. Watch this space, I guess, as people work on the technologies to bring the carbon footprint of asphalt down even further. Thanks for listening.